So our next speaker is Professor Mithun Mitra from IIT Bombay. He will be speaking on a fine balance, optimal behavior in biological systems. Thanks, uh, thanks Arijit and the organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, so I'm also a former student of math science. Um, I, I joined way back in 2002, so it's been more than 20 years now uh, since I came here as an integrated PhD student. So it's, it's always uh, nice to be back. It's nice to see familiar faces, uh, old friends, and so on. Um, like Kapil was mentioning, you know, you never forget the, your first institute uh, where you sort of began your journey into science, so to speak. So it's nostalgic, it's, it's nice. Uh, Gautam is here you know, with whom I did my PhD and so on. Um, so it's nice to, to be back. And um, yeah, it was nice discussing all sorts of antics we used to get into, um, the late night general body meetings and so on, uh, which is not a suitable topic for discussion for something which is being recorded. So I will uh, skip to uh, my talk. So what I thought I'll do is, uh, so I'll talk about optimal behavior in biological systems. Um, so since this is supposed to be meant sort of for a general audience, I'll, I'll uh, not try to get into too much detail. So this is sort of three, four things that we've been working on over the last couple of years or so. And um, I mentioned biological in sort of italics because uh, I'll take inspiration from biological systems, um, but um, I'll try to also cast it in a sort of more physics-y language because at least some of the results I believe uh, will perhaps be of broader interest uh, than the motivation that we started the problem from. All right. All right. Uh, so these are uh, problems uh, that I'll be talking on today are mostly to do with chromatin organization. So I'll take two minutes uh, to sort of introduce what is chromatin. So all of us uh, know what is DNA. So DNA is this double helix. It contains all the genetic information. And then the central dogma is that this information is uh, transcription and translation, converts this into proteins. And that's the machinery of life. Um, however, you know, uh, it's true that all of this genetic information is encoded in DNA. But then this protein production is not a continuous process, right? So proteins are being produced at some time, they're not being produced at other times. So there is an enormous amount of regulation that is involved as to when proteins are produced. When some proteins are produced, some other proteins are not produced and so on. So all of that, um, all of that is something that is beyond the information that is contained in the genetic sequence and what is broadly called as epigenetics, which is, involves various things, histone marks and so on and so forth. Uh, but one of, the, one of the aspects is this, um, uh, how the chromatin itself is packaged into the nucleus. Okay. So what is chromatin? So you have this DNA double helix, um, and then you have this, uh, this protein called the histone. So this DNA double helix wraps around this histone to form what is called the nucleosome. Uh, so this structure is a nucleosome, so you know, I brought my charging wire. So here is my protein and here is my DNA. It sort of wraps around. This thing is a nucleosome, right? And then you have these uh, DNA floating around. And then these nucleosomes sort of package to form this uh, chromatin fiber. And then this chromatin fiber further packages. So there's a hierarchical packaging that happens at multiple scales. Because if you stretched out your DNA, that's something like, you know, meters long object. It's a meter long string. And you have to package it inside a nucleus, which is about microns, which is a few microns, right? So there needs to be a lot of packaging that, uh, that happens. And this packaging cannot be random. There has to be some uh, principle, some structure behind that. Um, so one of the central motifs of this packaging is the formation of these uh, long loops of chromatin. Uh, and these loops are formed by special proteins called uh, loop extrusion factors or structural maintenance of chromosome SMC proteins, uh, such as cohesins and uh, so some proteins. Okay, The name is not important. So the first problem I'll talk about has to do with these loops. And these loops have a structural importance uh, in that they sort of condense the chromosome. They have a functional importance in that they bring together distant segments of the DNA. And perhaps when these distant segments come together, some proteins are expressed, some other proteins are not expressed, and so on and so forth, right? So it, it is a, it's, a, it's a functional unit. It's also a structural unit. Um, beyond, this, beyond these loops, uh, you have these folded domains called topologically associated domains. So you have um, regions where this uh, chromatin polymer is really crumpled up like this. And uh, so these are highly compact objects where you have many, many connections between uh, distant parts of the DNA. So again, these have some regulatory role. And in the second part, I'll talk a little bit about uh, these topologically associated domains. 
And then in the third part, if I ever get to it, I'll talk a little bit about chromatin compartments. All right. So that's the setup, right? So that's the biology. So I'll talk in the beginning about these uh, chromatin loops. All right. So chromatin loops are formed by these, uh, like I said, by these proteins called these loop extrusion proteins, which very simply, you know, from a physicist's point of view, it has this ring-like structure. And what this, uh, what this uh, ring-like structure does is that it has this double ring sort of a thing. So it sort of uh, topologically binds the DNA. And then it sort of, it, as it walks along the DNA, you extrude a sort of loop. So that's what is being shown in this uh, cartoon over here. It binds and then as it walks along the DNA, it sort of extrudes the loop. Um, but as it walks along the DNA, like I showed, it is not walking along bare DNA. This chromatin consists of DNA which is packaged around, around nucleosomes. And what has been shown is that, uh, so this is my DNA packaged around nucleosomes and then I have this protein, this uh, loop extrusion protein, which meets this nucleosome, okay? And it so happens the sizes of these objects are comparable. And experiments have shown that this nucleosome actually acts as barriers to the motion of this cohesin. So here is my cohesin, which has this ring-like object, and here is my nucleosome protein. And when a cohesin meets, when this cohesin ring meets this nucleosome protein, most often what happens is that it sort of uh, gets reflected back. Uh, these are some sort of experiments which shows that. Uh, let me not get into the details of the experiments. But these nucleosomes act as barriers to this, uh, to this cohesin ring. Once in a while, so most often it will get reflected back. Once in a while it will cross over and move on to the next segment. Okay, so, um, so that's the idea. Um, but because these are barriers, the expectation therefore is that when these loop extrusion proteins are moving on this DNA backbone, the more and more barriers that you have, uh, the more uh, the motion of these proteins will be slowed down. And then the question then, uh, so if you were to look at trajectories of this uh, cohesin then, if you had a high nucleosome density, perhaps what you would see is something like this, where the, uh, so let me just say, so this, um, this x-axis is space, this y-axis is location along the DNA strand. So if you see a flat line, it means that the protein is not moving at all. Uh, whereas here where you had a single nucleosome at this location, uh, the protein was moving. When it meets this nucleosome, once in a while it will cross over, but most often it will get reflected back. So that's the barrier. Okay. So here I have an object, my protein, which is moving along a 1D string, which is my chromatin, and it meets obstacles, which are these nucleosomes. And I want to ask that how long does it take for this protein to reach certain uh, points, reach certain endpoints. These endpoints have some biological significance. These are CTCF sites, but as far as the physics problem goes, I can just ask if I had some target sites, how long does it take, uh, f how long does it take for this uh, protein or for a random worker uh, to reach these target sites as I have these obstacles, okay? So I now switch a little bit to, to this language of stochastic processes. So what I'm looking for is first passage times of a random worker, which is diffusing on a one dimensional backbone. As I, as I increase my number of obstacles, as I have more and more nucleosomes in some sense, okay? All right, so if I cast this as a, a physics problem, um, how to find mean first passage times is a well-studied problem in stochastic processes. So if I think of simple diffusion just for two seconds, uh, so I have a random walker here, it, let's say on a, 1D, on a 1D lattice, it can take a hop to the left with some rate p, it can take a hop to the right with some rate p, um, so therefore, on an average, the time it spends on at each site is like 1 over 2p. And then you can write down a recursion relation for the mean first passage times. So if it started from site i, it spends time uh, 1 over 2p. And then with probability half, it goes either to the left or to the right. You can take the continuum limit of this equation and you can write down a differential equation for this mean first passage times. Um, once you've written out this equation, you can try to solve this for different boundary conditions. So this is like a standard textbook problem. If you have absorbing boundaries, you get some solution. If you have some one ab boundary absorbing, one boundary reflecting, you get some other solution. So, right. All right. So now I want to do this, but now I want to do this uh, where this lattice is not empty, but it is filled with obstacles. Okay. So that leads me to think about what are obstacles. How do I do, how do I construct an obstacle? Okay, so the first way that you can create an obstacle is to say that, well, I have these regions, these blue regions, where, which is like my bare DNA, where there is no obstacle. And then I have these red, red regions, which are my obstacle regions. And the way I'll implement an obstacle is that I'll say that when my random worker enters into these red regions, 
um, it diffuses with a slower diffusion coefficient, right? So in these blue regions, I have a diffusion coefficient d1. In these red regions, I have a diffusion coefficient d2, and d2 is less than d1. Okay. So I call these uh, entropic barriers because the slowing down of motion comes because it is exploring these uh, slow regions with, with much longer times. Okay. So you can write down, uh, so in both of these regions, you can write down what is what the mean first passage time will look like. In region 1, you will have the diffusion coefficient d1 in these fast regions. In the slow regions, you will have the slow diffusion coefficient d2. Uh, the trick is, of course, in doing the boundary conditions uh, and the int at the interfaces what happens. So I say that, uh, well, I have a reflecting boundary condition here and I have an absorbing boundary condition there. And I'm going to start there and I'm going to calculate the time it reaches at x equal to L. Okay. Um, and at the interfaces between the slow and fast regions, you can write down what are the boundary conditions. That is fairly simple in this case. Uh, the times are equal, the currents are, the fluxes are equal. And you can solve this. Uh, so this was solved, uh, this is my PhD student Shogoto who is soon going to graduate. So you can solve this exactly, analytically, and ask that, well, what happens to the uh, what happens to this time starting here to end there as I increase the number of barriers? Okay. Um, and as it turns out, so well, uh, I should explain. So my axis over here is A over B. Uh, A is the length of my barrier regions, which is fixed. I have some fixed barrier width in this case. B is the length of my linker regions, the regions between my barriers. And therefore, as I increase my number of barriers, what decreases is B, and therefore A over B increases. So when I plot this axis A over B, you should think of A by B increasing as increasing the number of barriers. Okay. And as I expect, if I increase the number of barriers, as I increase the number of obstacles, the time taken to reach the other boundary increases with the increasing number of obstacles. This is what my naive intuition would tell me, right? And that works out, so it's, it's in that sense nice. Uh, but then is this the only kind of obstacle that you can have? So if you, if I go back and think about this cohesin problem, this uh, protein moving on the DNA problem. Um, so you remember I had this thing uh, looped around my uh, histone protein and then the ring came and crossed it once in a while, most often it came back. But once it crossed it, it actually uh, crossed a sort of finite segment of DNA. Okay. So taking inspiration from that, what we did was to define a different sort of barrier, which is we call as an energetic barrier, because most often it's like a, you can think of it in a, like this classic Kramer sort of a barrier. You come, you most often get reflected back. Once in a while, you'll cross over. Um, so again, it's a very similar setup. My barrier regions have a width A, my free regions have a width B, but now in this case, you do not really enter the barrier regions, but when you come to the interface, with some small, ra small rate Q, you're going to hop across this region into the next free region, okay? So I have this uh, hopping rate P in the free regions, and then I have this hopping rate Q to hop from one barrier to the other, where Q is much, much less than P. That's the whole point, so that it is indeed a barrier, right? And again, you can solve this problem. Uh, so again, you can write down what is the equation for the mean first passage time. You can find out what is the conditions of the interfaces in this case, uh, the boundary conditions, uh, the conditions of this interface between the slow and fast regions is slightly non-trivial, but still one can derive it. Uh, once you've derived the uh, conditions, you can write down an exact solution for this, and you can write down what is going to be the mean first passage time as a function of the number of barriers. Um, so this symbol R over here is my A by B. So increasing R is increasing A by B is increasing number of barriers or obstacles. So here something very funny happens. So here is where I have no barriers. I have some time that I take to go from one end to another. As I increase the number of barriers, the time increases, which is what I would expect. But then beyond a certain critical number of barriers, this, uh, this time starts to decrease again. So this is a very counterintuitive phenomenon. You have water obstacles. And as you put more and more obstacles, beyond a certain critical number of obstacles, the time taken to reach the other end starts to decrease. And if you will notice, uh, this happens, this sort of uh, maximum time in some sense, happens when A by this ratio, A by B, this is why we plotted in this A by B axis, this sort of funny axis instead of N. This uh, maximum happens when this A by B is equal to one, which means that when the width of my barrier region is roughly equal to the width of my linker regions, the free regions between the barriers. 
And um, so I'm not going to talk about this, but you know, it's not just a question of first passage time. You can calculate the effective diffusivities uh, for these two cases, and that also so shows a similar uh, non-monotonic behavior for energetic barriers, but a monotonic behavior for entropic barriers. So this sounded counterintuitive enough that we uh, sort of wondered that, you know, whether we can actually test this out. Um, it's nice to do the maths, but it's uh, nicer to sort of see it in front of your eyes. Uh, so we took the help of uh, former uh, IIT Bombay master student, Momita, who is now a faculty member at Augsburg, and a student, Leon Ambrister, to see if we can come up with a simple enough way to sort of test this. Okay. And what she used was this sort of a robotic bug on a tabletop. And this robotic bug does its own sort of thing. Um, so it does uh, slightly super diffusive motion at short time scales, transitioning to diffusive behavior at longer time scales. So this is the MSD of this robotic bug. Um, and then we wanted barrier regions, right? So for barrier regions, what she did was to place these uh, wooden pegs in front of these, uh, of these bugs. So that, you know, when it tries to cross a region that is filled with these pegs, it'll get, it'll hit the pegs and it'll get reflected back and it'll take more and more time. And indeed, we checked that you know, if I have some finite region and I have a region which is empty, uh, a tabletop which is empty versus a tabletop which is filled with barriers like this, indeed, in these barrier regions, you take more time to cross a certain segment. So these do act as barriers. Okay. So now here is my setup. Um, so this, uh, so I have a table, literally, not I, they have a table. Uh, and you have a segment which is empty of anything. So this is my free region. Then I have a segment which is filled with these small barriers. So this is my barrier region, but this is like my entropic barrier. So this is my, like my slow region because my bug, this is my robotic hex bug, this can enter this region, except that it will just traverse this region slowly. Okay. And then you start this bug here, you uh, note down the time that it takes to reach the opposite end of the table. You do this again and again. So these are example trajectories and you calculate the mean first passage times. Uh, so you start with one such strip, uh, one such barrier strip, you increase the number of barriers, one, three, five, and so on and so forth, and you calculate the mean first passage time as a function of the number of barriers. And indeed, as uh, you, we expected from our calculations, the first passage time increases with increasing barrier number monotonically. Um, so as you have more and more barriers, it sort of gets, uh, it takes longer and longer to traverse. But now can we test the other sort of barrier where we had the more interesting sort of results. Um, so to do that, what they did was to create these sort of tunnel barriers. So what you have over here is a styrofoam block and you cut these small, uh, hopefully you can see this, you cut these small tunnels in these styrofoam blocks, okay? So when this bug comes, uh, most often it will hit one of these regions where the styrofoam is blocked and it'll just get reflected back. Once in a while, if it approaches this hole in just the right orientation, it is going to zip through this and cross over into the other side. Okay. So this is like my uh, sort of uh, energetic barrier. Okay. And if you do this, ex and if you do this experiment, and again, these are sort of example trajectories. If you do the, this experiment and you have one such styrofoam block, um, three, five, and so on and so forth, you increase the number of barriers. What you see is that this time taken to traverse, uh, time taken to traverse this table uh, does indeed have a non-monotonic behavior and the peak happens at A over B equal to one. This peak is a slight oddity because the bug, did, at that number of barriers, the bug did not have space to turn. So it, that one should disregard that point. But you have this peak again at A over B equal to one when the size of the barrier regions is comparable to the size of the free regions. So that was nice. Uh, one could see sort of an experimental realization that indeed, depending on the nature of barriers, whether these are these energetic sort of barriers or entropic sort of barriers, you can have this non-monotonic behavior of uh, first passage times. This is true for super diffusive motion as well. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, so this is a very recent preprint, which is currently under review. It was uploaded on archive last month. Um, but what does this mean for uh, cohesion looping times? So if I now come back to this cohesion problem, what it means is that if I look at, think about the looping times as a function of this uh, linker, linker length. So when I have this DNA that is loops around the nucleosome, the length of the DNA is around 147, so let's say 150 base pairs, okay? So the size of my obstacle in this problem is around 150 base pairs. So therefore, what it means, if I use realistic uh, uh, rates for cohesion motion, what it means is that this looping time is slowest when the linker, uh, when the linker length, the region between two nucleosomes, is also of the order of 150 uh, base pairs, 
But then if I have more and more nucleosomes, the process actually gets faster. And if you think about, if you ask in biological systems, what are typical uh, linker lengths? Typical linker lengths are around 50, okay? So if you thought of this as a monotonic curve, what you would expect is this red, let's say any, if I can look at any one of these curves, this red line to sort of continue growing up. Instead what it does in the regime where biology would be interested in is to come down and the looping times that you get then are sort of give you numbers for uh, looping times which are in line with biological estimates. Okay. So let's skip this. Uh, so this was work done by a former PhD student Ajay. Uh, now before I move on to the next problem, uh, I think I have 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll just say that you know you could think that well, um, okay I talked of these barriers, cohesion, some protein moving on some DNA. Is it a very specific case? And actually the answer is no. Uh, because biological cells are extremely crowded environments, often you will have such obstacles um, where this sort of motion, uh, motion of proteins, motion of various uh, biological objects in the presence of obstacles becomes important. So just to give one brief slide uh, example, so this is a, dros a, a Drosophila embryo, Drosophila is a common fruit fly. And in Drosophila embryos you have these um, energids. Uh, well, you have these, let me not get into the biology, you have these sort of uh, uh, proto compartments and you have proteins diffusing along these proto compartments. And uh, there has been previous work and there has been, uh, this is a figure from a paper of ours with our collaborators where we show that these compartments actually act as obstacles. So if you have a protein, which in this case could be a bicoid protein or something, uh, which moves along this region, these uh, compartments act as obstacles. And then if you, you could ask that what is the time taken to go from one end to another or from one location to another depending on the number of compartments that you have. And the number of compartments is variable because as the nuclei divide, your number of compartments double every cycle. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, this is work with uh, my collaborator uh, Amitabh at IIT and Richa at Aisir Pune. Uh, but I just want to say that you know this sort of setup where you have motion in the presence of obstacles um, is, is quite common in biological systems and it's common in various, in, uh, it's common in various uh, physical settings as well. Motion in heterogeneous media is in some sense a very classic physics problem. All right. Um, so for the next part I'll ask slightly related question. So now that I have this looped structure of chromatin, so this cohesin protein has come, it has formed a loop. Um, I asked that um, how do these loop structures affect search and residence times? And there's something that is done by one of, this is ongoing work uh, done by one of my PhD students, Shubhadeep. Um, so you have proteins which walk, which need to find their target sites along the DNA, okay? So proteins are produced, they need to go and bind at a certain location. Um, Inside, your DNA, inside the DNA for certain regulatory processes to happen, okay. How does this process happen? This process happens, uh, so, so here is my protein, it binds to DNA and then it searches for its target site along the DNA. The common view is that, you know, this search process happens through what is called as facilitated diffusion in that it searches along the, one, the DNA backbone for some time, uh, which is thought of as one dimensional diffusion. And then perhaps it dissociates and does 3D diffusion and binds back again somewhere else and does a little bit more of one dimensional diffusion and so on and so forth. Uh, but if you now think about this, uh, if you now think about this loop structure, this domain structure that I was talking about, this, when the protein is moving along, along this DNA and this DNA is highly coiled, what it sees is not a one dimensional structure, but a sort of a quasi one dimensional structure because you have these distant segments of DNA that are in contact with one another, that are in close proximity to one another, okay. Um, so here is a sort of experimental uh, graph which shows, these are called contact maps. So I'll just very quickly explain what is a contact map. So what it says is that if I take my, my chromatin polymer and I take one segment here, and another segment far away, I ask what is the probability that these two segments come close in contact, come close to one another, okay. You can answer this question experimentally through very, very, very um, clever experimental techniques which are called chromosome conformation capture techniques, in particular high C and micro C. And you can generate these maps. So these maps are visual representations of these matrices. So if you have a high intensity, what it means is that this segment I comes into contact with this segment J very often and then perhaps less often this segment I comes in contact with that segment J less often and where you see white there are perhaps no contacts at all. 
So, what you see is this sort of a square like structure that emerges from these contact maps, so it emerges from these matrices. And what it says is that you have these sort of domains, you have these sort of folded domains where you have a large number of contacts among these, poly, among these, uh, uh, among this polymer chain. Okay. So, the polymer chain uh, corresponding to something like this would look like this. So, you have a highly collapsed regions which are my topologically associated domains. And then if you have a protein that is walking along this backbone, it is not performing pure one dimensional diffusion, but it can do intersegmental hops where it can hop from this segment to this segment purely because although they are far away along the, along the topological backbone, they are close by in three dimensional space. So, we wanted to ask that what happens to residence times of proteins in the presence of such a structure, ok. And so, we took a very simple approach at first. We said that well, let me think of this one dimensional walk. So, a protein if there was none of these intersegmental hops, none of these long distance hops, the protein would do pure one dimensional diffusion. It would hop from i to i minus 1 or i plus 1. Now, you have these long hops where it can hop from i to j. So, what I will do is that uh, for a moment I will simplify my life and say that well I will forget about the polymer, but I will think of this as a network problem. A network problem where I have consecutive nodes which are always connected and then non consecutive nodes which are connected with some probability p ok. So, this is not a real polymer, it is a false, it is a, it is a toy polymer in some sense, but the advantage is that I can, I can solve this problem analytically. Uh, so, I asked that if I now introduce, so this backbone is always connected because that is my poly polymer topology and I make this long distance connections with some probability p. So, as I increase my probability p, I make more and more connections and I asked that well if I started a protein somewhere in this domain, how long does it take to escape this domain okay, as a function of this connection probability p. So, perhaps what I would expect you know if I had no connections, it is doing a pure one dimensional work. As I have, as I introduce some connections, maybe it can hop long distances and therefore take small time. But if I now keep on introducing this connection probability, what I see is again this sort of an optimal behavior. So, in initially as I put in more, as I put in connections, so p equal to 0 is like pure one dimension, pure one dimensional walk. As I put in more of this long distance hops, my time starts to decrease. If I put in too many of these hops, the time starts to increase back again because now instead of escaping, you have many more routes to come back inside the domain as well, ok. This is true, it does not depend on you know, um, it does not depend on the hopping rate uh, along the backbone. So, if I think of that as sliding and if I think of this intersegmental things as jumping, then it does not depend on the relative rate between the two, it's you still you always have this generic uh, non monotonic feature. Uh, but you could ask that well you know this is a toy polymer, um, um, does it have any relevance for real polymers? Um, so, we did some simulations using a standard polymer model. So, this is a LJ polymer model and uh, this model is parameterized by this, en this energy scale epsilon which so this is a it is a repulsive attractive potential. So, this first term models repulsion at short distances, the second term which comes with the minus sign models attraction. And basically you get uh, you get a location wh where you have an energy minimum and the value of the energy at that minimum location is epsilon ok. So, epsilon sets energy scale. As you increase this value of epsilon, uh, you increase the attractive interaction and the polymer starts to collapse. So, if you think of the size of the polymer, the radius of gyration as a function of epsilon for the simple LJ polymer, what you see is that as you increase epsilon your Rg the radius uh, the size of the polymer sort of decreases ok. So, for uh, you know small values of epsilon you have this open chain for large values of epsilon you have this uh, sort of a compact uh, collapsed polymer all right. But what happens to the time and the time again time continues to have this non monotonic behavior for as a function of epsilon. So, even though even as the polymer uh, uh, the topology the shape sort of goes from this open to collapsed the time taken to exit such a region has this non monotonic behavior as you start collapsing the time in decreases, but if you collapse too much the time starts to increase back again. Okay. So, again there is an optimal behavior as a function of this collapse parameter. Does it have relevance to real TADs? So, we went back and looked at these uh, uh, data from real TADs from these experiments that I was talking about um, some few thousands I have forgotten now. So, hum chromosome 17, 18 and 19. Um, and because the question might be that you know I am connecting these uh, sort of links randomly, whereas in real DNA these these connections might be sequence dependent, there, there might be sequence specificity. So, do these results mean anything for real tags? 
so if I now construct networks uh, using this real TAD data, so I extract this data, I get the connection probabilities, I construct networks that correspond to this sort of connection data, and I find out the times, uh, the time it takes to exit such real TAD-like domains. They have a perfect correlation with the results that we see for our uniform polymer, uh, this sort of random, not uniform, this random polymer, even this artificial polymer. So once you've averaged over enough number of iterations, uh, whatever sequence specificity is there in these loops do not matter. Uh, it appears that the exit times from real TADs tend to follow the same sort of behavior that we see for these uh, random, uh, random polymer networks. <laughs> Let me know, yeah. All right. Uh, for the final two minutes, I'll just uh, flash this slide. Uh, so I, t I talked about this fact that you have these proteins which, uh, so this, you know, when a polymer collapses, I, I was talking about this chromatin collapsing, I collapsed it in this case by changing the epsilon. In reality, what happens is that, is it collapses because of interactions with proteins. There are multiple proteins even apart from these loop extrusion factors like transcription factors, uh, PRC, uh, HP1 and so on. Uh, which, are, which can bring together distant parts of this, uh, which can bring together distant parts of this uh, chromatin uh, to form these sort of regulatory loops. And the, and the idea is that the more of these sort of uh, uh, binding proteins you have, the more collapsed your chromatin is going to be, right? Um, so you wanted to check uh, what happens to this chromatin conformations if you have multivalent binding proteins. And by multivalent, I mean, you know, a single binding protein can bind two or more, uh, more than two segments of the DNA. And this is true for biological proteins where, you know, it can bind five, six, in some cases, perhaps even more uh, segments of DNA. Um, and so just to show the result, what happens is that, um, again, I'm looking at the polymer size as a function of the number of binding proteins, okay? Um, what happens is that as I increase the number of binding proteins, my polymer collapses, as I would expect, because the binding proteins bring together distant segments of the DNA. However, if I increase my number of binding proteins beyond a certain threshold, the polymer starts to expand back again. This is true irrespective of what sort of compaction you put your polymer in. Uh, so these are different compaction, uh, these are results for different, uh, uh, compa uh, different compaction radii. Uh, the physics is the same, and this reswelling is in that sense driven, uh, this reswelling is driven by uh, excluded volume forces and entropic forces. So if you think about it, um, when I have very few binding proteins, my one binding protein tries to bring together many different segments of chromatin, so the polymer collapses. On the other hand, if I have many binding proteins, if I have a large enough concentration, then I, what I have is a binder cloud that sort of surrounds this chromatin, and that, that provides an excluded volume force and an entropic force for the polymer to stretch back out. Okay. Uh, so again, this is very recent work. It just came out a couple of days back with my PhD, with Shogato, who is my PhD student. So I'll stop here. So um, what I want to say is that, uh, you know, Stochastic processes offer, can offer a very useful tool to study biological problems. And when you look at these biological systems, even seemingly simple systems, um, collective effects can give rise to very non-trivial behavior, uh, which is implications for various biological processes. Uh, so I've acknowledged my students. I should also acknowledge to my collaborators with which most, whom most of this work was done. Uh, Ranjit in the bio department at IIT and Dibendu in the physics department. Uh, so thank you.